Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture two. So moving along with the course. As you can see from the title of the slide, today we're going to use Chisel, the language we're using for this course. And I want to keep emphasizing that Chisel is the vehicle we're using for this course. It's not the destination. The destination is to do agile hardware design. Uh, and it just happens to be a handy language you can use for today. But yeah, we're going to be using it. So you might as well go about learning it. So um, as I promised last time, and you know, in case you weren't aware, all these slides are not just on Jupyter and not just available open source. You can run them yourself. Uh, and you can run them locally or you can run them in the cloud. Uh, in the cloud, we use a service called Binder. It's free and you know available. That's why we use it. Unfortunately, it's a little bit slow at times. And so uh, right now, I'm actually running from it. You can see I'm using a Binder thing. Um, so go ahead and feel free to try it out. You can go ahead and play with it. You can play the code yourself while I'm talking. You can take notes, however you want to do it. One thing to note about binary, if you've never used it before, after a certain amount of inactivity, it'll kill the instance, right? It's a cloud instance that can spun up for you, but if you're idle for, you know, let's say approximately eight or 10 minutes, it's gonna kill it. So let's say you're doing like a lab later on, perhaps using that service, make sure you save your work and download it locally so that way you don't lose it. But people find that handy. You're of course also gonna run it locally. And of course, the install that shell script will help you get that set up uh, and help you get the right versions of things. And of course, if you have questions, Please ask us on Slack and we'll try to help you out. Cool. Okay. So that's getting set up. So what are we actually covering? Like I said, we're going to be covering Chisel. In order to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about Scala. And then we're going to do what I keep promising this, of course, and that is we're going to close the loop. We're going to actually show a small module. We're going to write it in Chisel. And then we're actually going to test it. See the entire process, right? Not just, you know, think about design only. The entire process. Close the loop. Okay. So, uh... Scala, first of all, right? So Scala is a language Chisel is written in. So what's going on with Scala? Well, it's a pretty fun language. So it was made, you know, I believe started in 2003-ish and was mature by 2007. Um, it's a Java descended language. has a lot of cool features in it. Um, some of the things that, you know, makes it most appealing for this class and for power design is it has uh, object-oriented programming, which of course you're all familiar with, but trust me, this is, you know, Objects on steroids. There's a lot more objects than you might realize. Um, also, the strong static type system. So uh, this is a little bit of an interesting thing where you think a lot about types in this language. But the cool part about that is uh, a lot of potential errors will be problems in other languages at runtime. You have to spend a hard time debugging. In Scala, they're actually compile time errors because they're type errors. Uh, and so yeah, so you, you, you learn to love the type system. It's pretty great. Um, additionally, the support for functional programming, which if you've never seen before, we're going to cover that along the way this quarter. That's a nice feature of the language. Uh, and as a Java descendant, you know, it can interact with Java code. So you can use Java libraries if you want to, or even, and of course, it runs in the JVM. And so, um, like I said, Scala's introduced a lot of cool features over the years. And if you kind of watch uh, languages like Kotlin and Java, they've kind of been copying Scala <laughs> and mimicking them. So now, you know, compare like leading edge Java and leading edge Kotlin, leading edge Scala, they're more similar than they were 10 years ago. But Scala's still great, and so we're using it. Uh, so why is this the language that the hardware development is being done in? Well, um, remember Chisel is an embedded language, meaning it's not a proper language, it's a library in existing language. And so Scala was made to make these embedded DSLs or embedded domain-specific languages. There's a lot of such languages in it. Uh, it has a lot of nice features in the language, makes it really easy, makes the syntax more nice and clear. Um, additionally, as so I keep talking about in this course, we're trying to you know, use software to make productive hardware. Uh, we're going to really take a lot of advantage of this knowledge oriented features as well as the functional programming features. And so uh, those two things are really helpful for making generators, and Scala has very good support for both those features. And then finally, as I said, right, the type system is great. Uh, the standard Scala collection library is amazing. These all kind of come together. Questions, comments so far? Okay. Um, so when you're running Scala, you have a few choices, right? Uh, you can do a regular compilation execution flow. This is what you do a lot of the time. Uh, and so, you know, you have a Scala program, you compile it, and then you run on JVM, right? Um, and so these types of programs need to have, you know, a proper structure, you know, needs to have a main and needs to have a class, et cetera. Uh, and usually you don't do this one file at a time. Even though you can do, you know, Scala C for a compiler, usually you don't do that. Usually you use a build tool. Uh, we often use SBT. Nowadays, uh, Mill is uh, another one that's out there. Uh, or I also recommend heavily in this course using the IDE. So I use IntelliJ and I recommend that heavily. Um, but the point is, okay, when you're running like a full-fledged base Scala program, yeah, you have a you know, build step already running. It compiles and runs. It's a big heavyweight thing. Um, 
One nice feature is the language that has a REPL. Uh, REPL, of course, is short for read, eval, uh, print loop, and that's, you know, basically an interpreter. So you actually can write a single line at a time and see what happens immediately. So you've seen this in Python, of course, in Python you can, you know, just, you know, write things in the interpreter and play with it. You can do the same thing in Scala. Like I said, normally if you actually have a Scala file and you want to run it, uh, it needs to be like properly enclosed inside of a class on the main, that kind of stuff. You can't just have a line, a file of, you know, line and line of Scala outside of a main class. However, uh, there's something called Ammonite, which allows you to make Scala like a scripting language. You can have just arbitrary Scala commands line by line like the interpreter. And actually that's the thing that powers uh, the notebooks. So actually, Almond, the thing that lets you run Scala inside Jupyter, is powered by that. So actually, in this course, we use these, um, this environment where you can just write arbitrary snippets of uh, Scala. So it's either me do that in lecture or I'll write no command at a time and show you a result right away. That's analogous if you're using the REPL uh, at home. So of course you can, you know, if you have Scala installed, you can type Scala in the command line and boom, you're inside a Scala REPL. Or even with SPT, you can launch a console to see it. There's a few ways to see it. But long story short, language normally needs a proper structure to program, you know, a class and a main goes through compilation flow, but there's ways of interpreting. We do a lot in this course of learning, so it makes it kind of fun and easy, right? We do it with Jupyter, we do it with an interpreter, et cetera. Cool. Great. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's actually try some stuff out. So uh, here we are with some, you know, Scala literals, right? So um, a few things to notice. We see we typed out some things here, let's say like two plus three, you know. Let's actually go ahead and run this. Hopefully main sets hasn't died. They can be slow. Uh oh, not a good sign. I have a backup window, don't worry. That's why we have backups. Okay, so <laughs> moving to the backup one. Uh, here we go. Uh, the backup one should be much quicker. Or did I lose Wi Fi? That would be a horrible outcome. Oh, we got it. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, here we go. And let's see if the other one even came back. No, it's still dead. Okay, so yeah, what happens? Well, yeah, you know, two plus three, yeah, that's five. Uh, you know, five point divided by two, okay, 2.5. The reason why I have these commands, so I want to show a few things, right? So number one, these are all literals, right? These are just, you know, raw numbers, right? Uh, by default, a number like this, and no decimals, of course, that's going to be an integer or an int. Um, if you have, a, you know, a decimal, that's a double by default in Scala. And of course, you can have strings. These are all uh, okay things to have. Okay, cool. Another thing to note is these are just, you know, commands one by one, like, you know, put another one in there, no problem, you know. Uh, notice how there's no semicolons, right? Uh, so the language is pretty smart with the syntax. You don't need semicolons. It can tell things based on the keywords you're using. So semicolons are optional, but really they're rarely used. Um, it's kind of nice. It's kind of a nice, very clean, pretty syntax. Cool. Why don't we try some more stuff, right? So what if we take advantage of the type inference, right? So uh, you know, some languages have a distinction between, you know, simple versus, you know, advanced or object types, you know, and this kind of stuff. Scala simplifies all that. Everything's an object, right? Everything is an object, everything has a type. Uh, and it's all statically typed, meaning that at the time your code is compiled, these types need to be known. Um, and so, yeah, everything's statically typed. There's only one type it can possibly have. However, what's interesting is that it's type inference. So you actually don't have to keep labeling all the types all the time. You can often leave the type specifier not in the code, and the language will figure it out on its own, the compiler will figure it out. Um, and of course, the other weird wrinkle is unlike many languages, it puts the type after the name, right? So in this case, these are all literals, but in a second, we'll see, you know, variables, and yeah, variables, once again, will also will be uh, putting the type afterwards. So yeah, we can go ahead and run these, and you see, yeah, you know, four by itself is an int, uh, okay. We can be extra verbose and say, yes, this four is an int, but it was inferred to be an int, sure. Here, for example, we, um, so you know, let's make it a float. And yeah, no problem, it can be a float. Uh, or make it a double, sure. Uh, how about that as a character? Yep, did that. Uh, or uh, there's two float syntax. This is a common convention when you want to convert things. There's often, you know, dot to and then a type name is often a common way to convert in Scala. Uh, you know, Scala is like many other languages. You can call functions on things by doing dot and then the function name. And like I said, even the number four, which is like, you know, a literal, right? Object, <laughs> you can call a function on it. So yeah, it's definitely a very heavily object-oriented language. Cool, questions so far? Cool, okay, let's keep going. So, um, when it comes to actually declaring variables, what's interesting is actually just two types. 
So you can have either a mutable or immutable variable, right? And so uh, most languages you've written before, you probably only had mutable variables and no distinction, but actually no. Uh, in this language, it's a functional language as well. It encourages you to use immutability, meaning you can't change things. So you think of it as like, like const in some languages, right? And so uh, the idea being, okay, uh, a var, you can do anything, right? You can reassign it as many times as you want. A val, you only can assign it once. At the time it's created, you give it a value and you cannot change that value. Um, and this is helpful, right? Because, uh, you know, basically most variables you can make is the vals. And that way, you know, if you accidentally change it, it, it warns you, right? So this code down here is going to work just fine because we declare this one as mutable, you know, as a var, so meaning it's mutable, we can overwrite it. Um, but let's say, for example, I tried to change const x. Uh, it's going to yell at me because, hey, you're reassigning to a val, right? You're not supposed to do that. Um, but it's really helpful, right? Because this lets you do things in your code, and you'll find this course, uh, you can basically do everything with Val. Uh, it's kind of a fun challenge. I, you even do literally everything with Val. Uh, I think that sometimes students in this course, they will see the two and like, wait a second, you know, Val can only do a subset of things Var can do, so that's not, Var is more general, I should use Var all the time. And they kind of go about programming that way, and, you know, my algorithm test cases can't check using Var, so you can get away with that. But when it comes time for you to debugging it, you're going to pay for it, right? Uh, so you're going you're to have more bugs. And so I, I would say the high correlation between numbers of bars in students' code and bugs, right? So try to get var down to as few as possible, if not zero. You're going to watch me in lecture, um, for the most part, not use var, maybe about like 1% to 5% of the time. And then occasionally I'll show you, you know what, even though I'm all about using val and let's be immutable and functional, there's a few places where using var makes the code actually cleaner and it's not that dangerous, and so we should just do it, right? So it's not like a never. I'm not like a total absolutist, but I'm going to try to encourage you to use val whenever possible. Yes? Oh, good question. So I'm going to repeat this for, for the recording. Uh, you know, so a lot of languages, you, compilers can recognize all the uses of a variable, and thus it could determine um, whether or not it's really a var, or maybe it could, you know, downcast a var to a val. Uh, so let, let's be clear about what we're getting from these uh, abstractions, right? So the var versus val in this case is about semantics of the program, right? You are allowed to change a var, you are not allowed to change a val, right? And so with regards to the situation you described, the compiler analyzing your code and recognizing you only wrote to a var once, well, that doesn't change anything from semantics for the user, right? The user, you know, wrote to the var once, they could have used a val there, right? Perhaps a smart ID might even recommend that. You know what? Maybe you should use a val there. That comes something perhaps an ID could suggest to you. Uh, when it comes to optimizations, you're right. That normally, an optimizing compiler can look at this and say, oh, vals, it knows for sure it's safe to optimize because it's really easy to know uh, they're not going to change. A var, it might need to be more cautious. You're right. A really smart compiler could look at a var, look at all possible accesses to it, recognize oh, there's only one right and optimize accordingly. That's theoretically possible, of course. But like I said, independent compiler optimizations, this is about semantics, right? Like, if you declare things val, and then later on in your code you change something, and you get this error because you accidentally reassigned to it, it'll tell you, right? <laughs> and I said, you kind of get this habit of, you know, basically every line of code is a new val. That's fine. Scala is a garbage collected language, so it'll automatically recollect all the variables. That's totally okay. Um, as you keep writing things, you know, you have like, you know, val. So I can't, you know, reassign it, but I can, you know, make another one, right? And that's totally okay, right? Um, and so what's nice about that, sometimes you can explain what's going on with your code. You can kind of have very descriptive variable names line by line explaining what you're doing. Okay, this is what this is. But next line, val something else. And you kind of explain what you're doing. So just, like I said, as you kind of get used to using val all the time, you get this kind of nicer, cleaner code as, you know, write once, functional style programming. Um, it goes along with that. Great points. Other questions? Yes. Oh, I've not answered that question. I, I can talk about that right now off the cuff. Okay, the question was, what about LLMs in this course? Um, so as an instructor, my goal is help students learn, right? And so coming into this course, uh, you know, I always do try out the tools myself to see how good are they getting in there. They're getting better. Um, the policy is, number one, when you turn in work, you're responsible for it, right? So let's say you were to use an LLM to generate some code for homework, and it's wrong. Well, you're wrong, right? You can't say, well, it's the LLM's fault. No, no. Like I said, you're wrong, right? Like, so you turned in with your name on it, you're responsible for it. 
Um, and so that's the thing I found with LLMs so far, and I played with them so much, is that they can be surprisingly good at a lot of things. And so as a veteran at a lot of tasks, when I use an LLM, I find, wait, I can do this task, takes some amount of time, but if I use LLM, I can do it faster than me, and it's right, isn't that nice? I save time. Um, however, it's occasionally wrong. We've all seen it, right? It's, it's quite confident. It's actually writing like prose. It's quite confident. It's so sure of itself. It's like, no, bro, you're wrong. It's like not correct. If you're learning something, you may not know when it's wrong, right? And so um, as a result, uh, you got to be kind of careful. So my advice to students normally, just in general, agnostic of this course is, if it's something you know how to do, using an LLM, you operate as a way to do productivity gain. You can recognize when it's wrong. You can debug when it's wrong. You can fix it when it's wrong. If it's something you're doing for the very first time, doesn't mean you can never use it. You got to be much more careful, right? Because it could be wrong and you wouldn't know it. Um, but it's not to say that an LLM couldn't be your best tutor, right? Like you could have it, you know, coaching you along the way and you could be a tutor together. And so I'm not going to explicitly disallow that. Um, but like I said, make sure it works. And the other thing to remember is um, there's three categories of assignments in this course. There's the labs, the homeworks, and the project. The labs are, you know, very short and quick. Um, hopefully there's not motivation using LLM for those. <laughs> uh, for the homeworks, uh, they're supposed to be for learning, right? So if you're doing LMNOs, that would not be as ideal. Honestly, the project, if you make something that works and it's good, with an LLM, I actually wouldn't mind, right? As I said, if you're making like, like a good project, you know, by the time you get to the project stage and you're good at chisel, and it's just making you more productive, that doesn't bother me as much. Because once again, you're putting your name on it. This is your project. You've made code, et cetera. So that's kind of stance, right? Because as you can imagine, right, like for a four-line step of the code, how can I prove you did or did not use an LLM, right? That's really hard to do. Um, good question, though. Any follow-up questions, comments? Cool. Okay. So yeah, so in general, like I said, we're gonna try to use Val for um, Scala variables. Um, so that's the you know whirlwind <laughs> introduction to uh, Scala. We're gonna keep fleshing out our next few lectures. So basically, between today's lecture, Friday's lecture, and next Wednesday's lecture, by the end of next Wednesday lecture, if not sooner, you should be able basically be able to do everything you can do in structural Verilog, right? So in just like a matter of like a handful of lectures, you're gonna have the same amount of power as you would in Verilog, with structural Verilog, I should say. Uh, and then guess what? We have another, you know, nine weeks <laughs> to get like that much faster and much more powerful, right? And so we're, we're gonna kind of do baby steps. We do a little bit of chisel, a little bit of Scala, a little bit of design ideas and kind of keep mixing them together. And so today, like I said, the goal is to close the loop. So I, we've already covered a little bit of Scala. Now we're gonna cover a little bit of chisel and we're actually gonna try and show an example design in a minute. So as I keep saying, right, uh, chisel is a language we use that's embedded in Scala, meaning Actually, everything you're writing when you're writing Chisel, you're actually just writing a Scala program. So your hardware design is a Scala program. When you want to work with your design and you actually run your design, your design is a program that actually builds up the hardware design as a graph inside memory. And then the output, perhaps the log, you can pass other tools. That's the side effect of your program that actually is what you want, right? Um, and so really what Chisel just is, it's a library in Scala, right? So a Chisel design is simply a pro Scala program that happens to use a Chisel library, right? Uh, but what's nice is because Scala is designed to make embedded languages, uh, a lot of Chisel syntax actually looks pretty native and nice. You feel like you're actually writing like a real full-fledged language. Um, and so I'll, I'll highlight some of these examples as we get through it, but it's kind of fun. And if you read more about it, just when you learn about how Chisel actually works and how actually certain things get mapped down to the library, you're like, oh, wait, that's actually pretty cool. Um, maybe it's kind of an early example of that. If I go back a slide. Um, so, uh, you know, if I take const x, I should be able to tab complete and see some functions. These are, you know, some types. Yeah, whatever. But, okay, let's say we want to do something like floor is not very good. Um, what would be a fun function? Um, I don't know, byte value or something. <laughs> sure, but the key thing is, uh, this is also gonna do the exact same thing. Oh, never mind. Forget this example. <laughs> it doesn't let me do post six on it. Uh, but well, some of the things we're talking about when it comes to making the syntax ignite, you can do what's called post six, and so you can basically have things that look like fully fledged independent operators we are actually calling functions on things. That example I chose was poor, I'm sorry, but we can keep going. Okay, so, how might your tool flow look? Well, like I said, your Scala design, sorry, Chisel design, I just, you know, 
looked him up, is a Scala program, right? So it's a dot Scala file. Perhaps the bigger desire to have many dot Scala files. Sure. Uh, you pass these off to the Scala compiler. It compiles them. It makes a program. Uh, that program, of course, runs on top of the you know, Java virtual machine, the JVM. Uh, that program, of course, also makes reference to the Chisel library. And then you're going to do something with that, right? Most commonly, what you're going to do with that is you're going to turn that into what is called fertile. So what is fertile? Fertile is an intermediate representation of your hardware design. It's a concrete design instance, right? So when you have your chisel program, you're going to write a design generator, right? Meaning you can take parameters, you can change the value of parameters, and you can change the design that comes out. By the time you've made fertile, that's a specific design instance, right? There's no questions about what's going to happen, right? Like, you know, you have this many wires, this many gates, and they're connected in this way. That's set up in fertile. Now, this fertile file... You're going to pass it off to a backend, which is more tools on their slide later today, which is going to be turned down to Verilog. It can simulate it, uh, it can, you know, et cetera. Um, but the kind of key point is, yeah, your chisel program is just that. It's a program in Scala, which uses the chisel library to produce the actual hardware design. And we call that process elaboration, where you have, you know, your design. It's a generator, typically. Um, and, yeah, you get, you get an actual concrete design out. Cool. So... Let's go ahead and try loading it up. So uh, in the notebook, we can go ahead and load Chisel now. So before we were doing just Scala, now I'm loading up the Chisel uh, components within there. Now note that um, this was really quick. If you're running for the first time on a new machine, it's going to take a couple minutes to download a bunch of packages for the package manager, but you know, so be it. Uh, it will get through it. <laughs> um, that's, uh, you know, I be working behind the scenes. Okay, so... Let's uh, see some chisel types, right? So chisel, it's actually, its core language is pretty simple. When people do clever things with chisel, it's usually not because of chisels, because they're using things in Scala, right? So for example, like, okay, well, think about what you would have as types in a hardware design. Well, you have these raw types. You have like a bool, which is a, a one-bit signal, sure. Uh, you know, uh, it's, of course, it's binary because it's hardware. Uh, you can have a uint, which is a... Uh, you know, a bus and some number of wires working together as an unsigned integer. Uh, that's a very common type. It's probably maybe the most common type. Uh, and then, of course, there's an essent or a signed integer if you want to have that collection of wires treated as a signed number. There's, there's also more types. Right? Of course, you can have things like modules for an entire component. You can have collections like vex and bundles. We'll cover those in future lectures. But for now, today, <laughs> just a single bit is a bool. And, you know, a number can be a uint. Now, let's talk a little more about these two things, right? For example, for the case of the bool, uh, that name is chosen to convey it's a single binary value. It's not to be confused with Boolean, which is the Scala bool thing, right? So Scala has its own type for Booleans, right? Uh, and Chisel's one-bit thing is bool, so they're actually two different types. Um, and so, for example, if I comment the setter code out temporarily and we run this, we see, okay, yeah. So, for example... The true literal by itself, that's a Scala value. That's going to be a Boolean. These other three things are bools, the chisel types, right? And you may notice this interesting syntax where uh, to declare these things, we're actually using this dot B, right? So we're using this dot B on zero to cast it as in a bool. So, you know, in this case, zero is false, right? We can make, you know, true as a bool. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, or we can even, you know, do it this way, right? But the, the point is we actually can use this suffix here to cast the type. Cool. So that's for bool. Now let's say we wanted to try the uints. Now what's uints is interesting is you can have just the number. Well, just the number we know is going to be uh, int. That's Scala, right? And now if we put a dot u on it, that makes it a uint. That's a chisel type. Uh, okay, cool. Or we can say dot u, and what's this over here? This is the width specifier. So we say I want a 8-bit wide thing. Now what's interesting is here we did not specify a width. What happens? Well, if you look down here, uh, this is the value. This is the width. So it actually it inferred the width. It says, you know what, if you want a literal, it says the value is 6. Well, you need at least 3 bits to represent that. And it figured that automatically. Now a lot of times in designs, you know... Uh, you need something more. You need more space, right? Okay, I know. I know. I want a bit signal. No problem. You can put explicit width if you want. Uh, here's just more examples of the syntax. It's all. These are all kind of you know, very similar, right? You can see once again. Uh, you know, what does it take to hold number four? You need three bits. Um, you can also put it inside eight bits if you want. 
Now, like I said, this is really adaptive, right? So you make this three, which can fit in two bits. This goes down to two, right? That can fit in two bits. Question, yes. Oh, good question. So if I have mixed uh, whiffs, what happens? Uh, depending on the operation, uh, it will do different things. And I believe in one slide, actually this slide, uh, I'll come back to this. But basically, there's a link on this cheat sheet to a PDF that kind of tells you in this table all the rules for what happens based on bit whiffs or certain things, what gets extended, what isn't extended, what's the result size. I can remember all that. That's written down in that cheat sheet. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, will it truncate? Let's find out. Okay. So, Val, uh, trunk question mark? You know, uh, let's say, you know, 1024 or 1023, right? We can be a little sneaky and then let's try and put that into five bits. I believe it's going to give you with five bits and it's going to clip the literal. Oh, no. It's going to say you shouldn't do that, which is nice, right? It's what we want, right? <laughs> Uh, it actually caught the uh, error message. This quarter, we are using a slightly newer version of Chisel, which one of the promises was it's supposed to have better error warnings. And so, yeah, perhaps it's a new one. I don't know for sure. But yeah, it's telling you, hey, you asked for a value, which you said you only want five bits, but you need at least 10 bits. So, hey, good job, tools, right? Compile time errors, not a surprising runtime error, right? I think we've all had experiences with Verilog where you've done things. Tools are just fine with it. They ship it and it doesn't work. It's been forever debugging it. The whole point is make things compile time errors, right? We want to find out as soon as possible things are not okay, right? In this case, as you know, suggested, we asked for a literal too big for hard-coded width. And yeah, it says you can't do that. Now, if I was to remove this, yeah, it's going to infer it needs 10 bits. Uh, yeah, 10 bits. Cool, great question. Um, you also have sign numbers, like you see down here. So like I said, a number by itself, Oops, uh, that's going to be, you know, just a Scala int, right? Scala ints are signed by default, you know, they're like an int in C. Um, and meanwhile, put dot S on it, that makes it a chisel S int. Uh, and yeah, you can set widths on it, et cetera. Um, cool. What's interesting is I believe if I make this positive two, it's going to increase the bit width, right? If you know two's complement, you can do minus two and two bits but you can't do positive two, let's see if I'm right. Yes, see, you can see right there, it went up one more bit. So um, it's handy. Like I said, when, you, when you're doing your designs, you'll tend to find there's some signals where you don't care how big things are and you won't specify it. And the tools will propagate and figure out how big things need to be. Are there places in your design where you care very much how wide things are and you just specify it, right? And of course, also because we're making generators, rather than being hard-coded numbers, they're gonna be parameter, right? Why not make that a parameter knob? Okay, really easy parameter knob, arbitrary bit width. Very easy to do. Let's, let's do that one. Cool. Okay. So, uh, you know, what operations are available? Uh, a lot of things you expect, right? You know, you can do rhythmic like, you, like you're used to doing. You can do logical operations. Um, so there's a cheat sheet, which should load up if I go to another tab. Oh, it's gonna download, so it's not as helpful, but it's a PDF that shows all these rules combined. Um, now, I think the one that's the most surprising, that's not that surprising once you get used to it, uh, equality test, totally valid thing to do in hardware. If you want a chisel equality test, it's three equal signs. This is one of the few places where the embedded language mask falls off. Uh, the reason why is the two equality sign thing is really important for language to know for equality of objects. The chisel developers kept running the issues of getting the two things mixed up, and so they made it simple. Uh, three equality signs is an equality test in Chisel, right? So you want to compare two signals, you use the three equality signs. Interestingly, did not equal one, has this nice graphical syntax, stuff like that. So that kind of checks out. Yes? I mean, very large triple equal, I think it involves sign in this, right? Doesn't it? You tell me. I, I'm not as much as a very large expert. Okay, yeah. So, oh, that's a great thing to bring up. So in response to that question, uh, Chisel by default is a two-state language when it comes to simulation, meaning uh, zero or one, there's no z, zero x's. Now that's been kind of grafted on later on, but yeah, it's, it's intended to be mostly zeros or ones. Um, 
It also will yell at you if things are dangling, which Verilog will often not yell at you for, which it would. Um, but yeah, so anyways, back to the operations you have. Um, like I said, the things you expect are there, arithmetic bitwise. Um, other ones that are you know, summarized here are things like extracting certain bits, uh, filling out bits, concatenating things, muxes, reduction. These are all kind of there, and they're summarized in this cheat sheet. Um, so here, for example, we have you know, two chisel uints. Totally fine. Uh, I showed you can add them together. This is how you would add them, and you would get a new number. However, um, chisel is not easy to run on the interpreter. <laughs> and so uh, usually chisel commands that work properly need to be inside of a module. A module is like a chisel component that has certain things it puts into the, um, you can think of that like the environment in a way around the code you're running. And if that environment doesn't exist, a lot of code doesn't work. So if I can go ahead and comment this out, it's probably going to break and we're not going to be able to see it. Yeah, there it goes, right? You see, like you see right now, it even tells you you should be inside of a module. Um, we can't quite do it like this, but this is fine because usually when you design hardware, you design hardware as modules, not just a line at a time. This is not a big limitation. Cool. More questions. Okay, I think maybe we're ready to try our first chisel module. So, this module is really trivial, right? You probably wouldn't write a module for just a single XOR gate, but let's do it, right? So, if you want to build an XOR gate as a module, we can see graphic on the right. This is something I drew as a human, right? Okay, there's an XOR gate, takes in two inputs, produces an output. Um, so yeah, so we actually worry about things like what is the I/O for the module? So that's where we're here. We have some boilerplate code here, you know, actually declaring the I/O. We have you know two inputs, an output. Notice everything here is bool those one-bit signals. Uh, the XOR symbol is the one you expect. The one thing to note, this operator. So colon equals. That's referred to as connect in chisel. And that's basically like an assign in Verilog, right? This is saying, okay, have a wire uh, or something like a wire and then want to, you know, attach one thing to another thing for all time, right? These things are going to be now connected, right? So yeah, so basically I'm saying, hey, connect the output to um, the result of this XOR operation. As you see, we can, see, we can just run it. Yeah, so guess what? We defined the class. We haven't done anything with it yet, but we define the class. Um, and so as the quarter goes on, this stuff will look less like boilerplate and more meaningful. But for now, copy paste it, change the lines you need, that kind of stuff. Um, cool. Questions? Um, so let's, now that we have a design declared, you know, prior slide, we have this class is defined. What does that mean? Um, well, uh, what can we do with it? Well, we can do a couple things with it. We can uh, print it as Verilog, right? So, you know, I can maybe run this command, but basically uh, in our Jupyter environment for this class, we set up a get Verilog command. So you can give it a module and it'll tell you the Verilog it looks like. And here are just print lines and Scala way to say, hey, print what I told you. Uh, and here's what you expect, right? Here's, you know, the module, the assign statement, end module, you know, input, output, all makes sense. Probably the only thing you weren't expecting is these two things right here, right? Uh, so by default, Chisel does clock and reset implicitly. And for much of your code, you don't really touch it. Like spend so much time in Verilog, like constantly writing clock as a module to thing, input to things, connecting clocks. In Chisel, you know, trying to automate things, realize, you know what, that's error prone. Let's do it automatically, right? So you don't have to keep declaring clocks and connecting clocks. It's implicitly passed around. You declare a register, it's connected to that clock, Things work out pretty well. Now, guess what? There are a handful of cases where you say, you know what? I don't want just one clock. I want multiple clocks. Multiple clock domains supported in Chisel. There's an API for that. You can have multiple clocks. But the common case is that most components which have the same clock domain, operating the same clock, you don't need to bother writing out the clock all the time. Now, looking at this module right here, you're saying, wait a second. That all makes sense. But this is combinational logic. Why should I care about the clock? Um, well, if we really want to, we can make a simpler module. Uh, I believe if I make this a raw module, the clock signal will go away. Um, but to be honest, uh, it's not super important, right? And why is it not super important? Once again, in the spirit of this course, make tools do the work. Those two inputs, the clock and reset, that are not connected to anything, any decent casual is going to prune those, right? It's going to cut those away right away. That's not going to be wasteful hardware. It's not going to cost you anything. Um, Means a human spending a lot of time worrying about does this have a clock or does it not have a clock? 
that's how I'm not spending making a design. In this case, like I said, by having that extra verbosity, uh, if I did not have this as a raw module, and it happened to, you know, in the Verilog, um, have that extra stuff there, so be it, right? The tool's gonna prune it away. It's not gonna cost me anything. Keep things simple. Um, but yeah, there you go. Uh, throughout this course, you'll often see me showing a certain module and then I'll show you the Verilog. It's not because the Verilog is really important for this course, it's more because I'm just trying to show what design looks like as a concrete uh, instance. Alternatively, instead of Verilog, I could show you that uh, Fertile I was telling you about. We mentioned we had that Fertile, which is the concrete thing in the back end, but I think people more likely in this room to understand Fertile, uh, Verilog than they understand Fertile, which is why I chose that and made that choice. Question, yes. Oh, so would the tools trying to be smart say he have disconnected unconnected ports? Uh, good question. Uh, in this case, no. Um, but you're right. There are certain cases where there's some ports where if they're not connected, that's a real problem. Other cases, it's okay for it to be disconnected. And so there's actually a bunch of, it sounds like a very simple problem. There's actually a certain depth to this complexity. <laughs> and so uh, in the newest versions of the Chisel language, they've actually expanded the types of connection operators, because depending on the situation, you really want one or the other, and it's a really nuanced issue. In this course, life is easy. We're using just one connection operator. It's easy to connect. <laughs> but, there, 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 but starting, uh, actually now, there's now four connection operators. And so like I said, there's a more richness in terms of how do you behave when things do or don't match up, uh, and, or do or don't like, get connected. So it's, 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 a, it's a deeper question. But for now, we're going to try and hope it does the right thing, and it, it usually will for this course. Cool, good question. Uh, it is basically for all time, right? So like, you can think of that as uh, non-blocking, right? It's not gonna infer any kind of uh, state element, right? So I was gonna kind of appreciate comparing Chisel to Verilog. So Chisel, um, the term like, the uses like to describe itself as a hardware construction language, right? So, um, that's in difference, uh, in contrast to Verilog, which is a hardware description language, right? So uh, believe it or not, Verilog is such an old language, it actually predates automated logic synthesis, right? So it was originally made to be a language to represent and simulate hardware designs before you actually did the manual gate work yourself as humans. And then as people developed logic synthesis and Verilog already existed, they figured out how to do synthesis from Verilog. But as a result, if anyone has written Verilog, you know there's plenty of things in there that you wouldn't design a language intentionally for synthesis. Like right now, we use Verilog primarily for synthesis, but there's certain things in the language that has for state elements, it's kind of this question of how do you write your Verilog in a way that causes it to infer a state element, right? And that's not really the way you want to do it. In Chisel, there's no ambiguity, right? When you declare things, you declare it as, you know, combinational logic or a state element. Like, I'm not sure today, but on Friday, we'll say, hey, I want a, a reg, you know, a reg. <laughs> Boom, that's actually a register. You have a register for sure. There's no question of will or will not infer it. Will infer a flip-flop versus a latch. Those are all chisel. Those are all Verilog things that Chisel just doesn't want to deal with. So Chisel, you only can describe synthesizable hardware. And that's kind of the nice part about it. Like it only can describe synthesizable hardware. There's plenty of anything new in Verilog you can't put in hardware. Um, so this is kind of like, you know the benefit of coming back, you know, 30, 40 years later as a new language to kind of improve upon prior languages. Yes. Uh, for shifting the clock, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, let's kind of talk through that, right? So number one, like I said, you can define clock domains and multiple clock domains design. They recognize which components of which clock, etc. cetera. Uh, when it comes to clock crossings between domains, right, there's all sorts of FIPOs. There's some stuff in the standard library for making sure that stuff is safe and that kind of stuff. Um, now for the actual stuff you're describing, like if you want to do a clock multiplier or a clock divider, that may be a situation where you perhaps don't want to do that in Chisel. So Chisel is designed to do uh, synchronous digital design. And depending on what you're trying to do, sometimes you're doing things that are more analog in flavor or even using built-in intrinsics in the hardware platform or even design library you're using, right? Perhaps you're using, you want to use a clock multiplier from design library. Fortunately, Chisel provides an escape hatch. There's something called a black box where you can basically say, hey, here's the interface and you tell it how to fill that thing in, right? And that thing you're often filling in is usually Verilog, and that Verilog can either be Verilog for something you want to do, or it can be um, 
uh, Verilog for like an intrinsic in your design library to essentially a certain component you want, like a certain feature in your hardware that already has a clock multiplier divider. Um, and additionally, when you have these kinds of signals, you can also, I only showed you a few of the types, you know, U and S and Bool, there are more types. Chisel has an analog type, which its main purpose is it'll tell a tool it's not to mess with the signal. Like this is an analog signal, something funny is going on here. Don't do your digital tricks on this, it's gonna break it. Um, but yeah, so there are ways, like I said, for you to have these components in your design, often through black boxes or whatnot. Uh, but yeah, Chisel's designed for that you know, 99% common case of synchronous digital design. Even doing things like a neg edge clock, um, you can do it on clock domains, but like that takes a little bit of gymnastics. It's not the common case. Yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's, it's a clock, and the question is when you have a register, how does the register behave? So the registers by default are positive registers. But, you know, let's say you're an industrial designer and you're, you know, your company wants to use latches. You could make a latch module, which internally is a Verilog black box, which instantiates the latch you want to use and design library you want to use. Um, the, interestingly, you know, this was the rationale chosen, you know, more than 10 years ago as a research language. And the researchers have seen great. And then they went off and made a company and other people use it in the industry to know now, years later, what was right or wrong with that perspective. There's been some friction, but it's actually not been that bumpy. The feature the hard designers most want in the industry that they've actually caved on is they want uh, asynchronously clocked resets on the registers. The language has native support for that where you can declare a register as synchronous, synchronous reset or asynchronous reset. That's a small detail to most people on the outside, but the industry is a really important thing. First class support in language for that the step difference. But otherwise, everything is synchronous and digital. Cool. Good question. Yeah, this is, this is a fun part of the course. It's kind of talking about like, what happens in language and what ifs. Cool. And this is also why I record every quarter, because every quarter is a different conversation. Um, fun. Uh, I can rerun this code. But yeah, this is basically showing, hey, if you want to visualize what you've built, there's something called the diagrammer. It takes in the fertile from your design. And it produces a picture. Now, in this case, the picture is not very exciting, right? Uh, can I see IOs to the XOR gate to the output? Um, but, you know, it exists, right? I'm just showing it's possible if it doesn't look exciting to you. Uh, you know, if you've also tried other CAD tools, sometimes the automatic schematic features aren't always super helpful. Um, but it's there. Okay, well, so we have our, you know, hardware design. It's there. How does it all fit together in a flow? Well, like I said, so the front end, you know, Chisel went through the Scala compiler and ran this program. It produces fertile or .fir the circuit, you know, and then what do we do with it? Well, we can use, turn in the Verilog like we just saw. We can turn in the fertile and then a picture, which, you know, is not drawn on this diagram. We just saw that in the diagram. Or you can simulate it, right? And so there's a few choices for simulation. Uh, one choice is to take your fertile and simulate that directly. There's a something called Treadle, which is a Scala simulator, which runs the design directly. That's what we use for this course. Uh, the main perk is it's really easy to get going, very low startup time, right? You just need to install a Scala, Scala package. It does automatically for, you know, dependency manager for this course, and it runs uh, very fast startup. And guess what? When you're running a simulation, of course, you also need to interact with it. You need to, you know, perhaps give it inputs and outputs to kind of you know, see what's going on in your design. So we use Chisel Test for that, which is a Scala program. So basically you can write a Scala program to talk to your design and you, know, you can interact with it. You'll see that in the example of that in a minute. Of course, as a simulation, you can you know, look at the output as text or you can make a waveform in the .vcd. That's all there. Um, alternatively, maybe you want to use a Verilog simulator. Fine, you can give the Verilog to a Verilog simulator and run a Verilog simulation. Uh, there's even built-in support in language to encourage it to use Verilators, for example. If you have Verilator installed, uh, in my own research group, we have our own simulator we've been developing called Essent. Um, that takes the fertile in directly, it doesn't wait for Verilog. And yeah, it's a very fast uh, simulator. It's actually the fastest RTL simulator. And so, yeah, um, you have choices, right? But the point is, yeah, when you have your concrete circuit, you can turn it into either a simulation or into Verilog. Uh, there's this thing called fertile in between. Like I said, fertile is in both the IR, the representation, as well as a library that converts things. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a hypothetical back end flow. In a minute, I'm going to discuss some of the changes coming to language, and this is going to change a little bit in the future. But for this course, this is how things are going to work. Just make you aware for the you know, long term. Cool. Okay, so 
let's take a look at chisel test, right? Like I said, so basically we have our design and we want to go ahead and, you know, interact with it, right? So um, what are we going to do? Well, uh, with chisel test, we can write a program and, you know, see what's going on in design. This is a really simple interface. It's called a peak poke interface. Peak poke interface, sorry. Basically, we can, you know, set the value of an input with a poke. We can read the value of an output of a peak. Um, and you can imagine that's a, you know, very primitive way. We can still kind of step through design and figure out what's going on. Now, even though peak and poke are very low-level operations, you know, setting the values of individual wires, reading the values of individual wires, with a sufficient, uh, sufficiently sophisticated Scala program using these, you can still do pretty cool test cases. They're pretty adaptive. Um, additionally, at times, uh, you will want to do things like an expect, which is basically a poke with an assert. In other words, you know, I'm going to read the value of a wire, and I want to make sure it's a certain value. If it's not a certain value, I'm going to throw an assertion and say the test fails. Um, so, so this is just getting started. Like I said, for today's lecture, we're kind of getting a taste of everything, a little bit of Scala, a little bit of chisel, a little bit of chisel test. Get the whole thing working, close the loop, and then throughout the coming lecture, we're going to keep fleshing out all these things in more detail. Um, so uh, remember we wrote an XOR gate. So what can we do? Well, we can, in this case, exhaustively test all four combinations, right? So here we are setting the you node know, value of input A to zero, input value of B also to zero, and then, hey, guess what? Uh, zero X or zero better be zero. Uh, that's what we expect, right? If we put in zero and one, okay, we expect a one. One and zero, expect a one, and then one and one, expect a zero. Okay, what happens if we run this? Uh, seemingly nothing, right? Because what happened? Well, it's because the test passed. If, the, if it was to have a, a failure, it would tell us so, right? Oh, wait, you know, you expected one, but I got zero, right? But yeah, no, if it passes, uh, life is good. It's kind of a nice, quiet thing. Cool. Questions? Yes. Yeah, there is. Not shown here. Um, but we will do that. Basically, the support for time delay is, is in terms of clock cycles. Like I said, so Chisel has this notion of, you know, synchronous digital design. And so um, the delay is in terms of cycles. So you can say, I want to advance one cycle, I want to advance n cycles. Uh, if you want to do timing precision uh, at less than a, a cycle granularity, let's say you want to do, like, you know, four microseconds. There's no way to describe that in Chisel. Chisel does not have a time scale parameter or anything. Uh, so yeah, it's all cycle level granularity. Good question. Like I said, it's a simplification, but like when it comes out the hardware, it actually makes life easier, right? Like that complexity we don't need most of the time. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the language is changing. It's constantly under development. So I uh, spent the last two weeks playing with all different versions and seeing you know, what works, what doesn't work for this course. Making the call, we're going on Chisel 3.6. What does that mean? Uh, Chisel 3.6 is a great version. Uh, it came out last April. Um, we use that for lecture, for the labs, for the homework. You basically use it for the entire course. Now, the reason why I didn't say project in that first line, if you want to try out some newer features in your version of Chisel for a project, be my guest. Why is it so important for me to be concrete about the version of Chisel or everything else? Well, everything else in this course is auto-graded, right? We want to make sure the auto-graders work. We don't want to have reasons, silly reasons why the auto-grader does not work. Keeping the versions the same is a great way to make sure that's the case, right? So when you pull the homework from this class, when you pull the labs from this class, they're going to set the chisel version correctly. They're going to pull the right version of chisel in. They're going to pile against it. Um, you shouldn't need to worry about this. But just so you're aware of what's going on, like I said, uh, the language has been changing. Uh, and so uh, chisel 3, oh, I forget. Let's say approximately 2015, 2016 when chisel 3 came out. And then to go from Chisel 3 to 3.6 took, you know, uh, what is that, seven, eight years. <laughs> uh, they decided to embrace a faster changing versioning scheme. And so thus, uh, after 3, or I should say after 3.6, they went to 5. They intentionally skipped 4. There was no 4. Um, and so of the release versions, 5.1 is the new hotness uh, that came out in November. Uh, 6 is under development and it's public. It's not some secret thing happening behind closed doors. Uh, you can see that in the public GitHub repo. There's even branches. You can see even releases for, you know, betas and release candidates, RCs. Um, it's out there. Uh, so, okay, so given all this, why am I using 3.6? A few things. Um, number one, most of the features that you benefit from new versions of Chisel, like 5 and 6, 
the benefit of features are not going to be apparent for the size of designs we're doing in this course. Uh, and it comes from costs that, to me, I decided the cost that way to benefit, right? In particular, I may remember when we go back to the, um, the back end diagram, I mentioned how uh, in current chisel, you generate a fertile file, and that fertile file goes through this fertile tool. This fertile tool is written in Scala. Uh, and so Scala is an okay language, it's, you know, but it's not as fast as plus, right? So it uh, turns out for large industrial designs, this spot was a real problem. And so they decided to fix that. And so they made another tool called Fur Tool, uh, which is built on something called Circuit, which is built on LLVM. So it's a C++ based LLVM based replacement. It uses way less memory. It's way faster. Uh, but this is when we have design that's going to be big, right? And our designs are not that big. So that benefit for speed doesn't come up for us. But to actually have that in your tool flow, you have to, you know, build LLVM, which that's a lot more complex than you want to do for a simple binder Jupyter <laughs> uh, thing here and there. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Uh, 3.6 is this bridge version, which uh, still supports the old Scala-based tool flow while including some new features. Version 5 abandons a lot of school Scala stuff and requires you to use this new circuit-based stuff. The other thing we would lose is chisel test, which I love. Chisel test is a great way for us to write test cases. Uh, the chisel, chisel test developers don't want to be left behind, so they've tried hard to make their thing compatible with chisel 5, but it's, it's a hack rather than native support. I'd rather have native support. So... We'll see. This is always kind of fun about this course is, you know, it's constantly in flux. So for this quarter, I'm, you know, we're doing 3.6. One year from now, who knows? Maybe we'll do Chisel 5, Chisel 6, or even different language. You know, it's always kind of changing. It's kind of fun to clear. And you can go through GitHub if you want to look at the GitHub history of this course and see how it's kind of changed over the years. We keep tweaking things. Cool. Uh, other questions? Okay. So then before we wrap up, I want to kind of give folks a little bit of logistics. So, um, as you're aware, uh, this coming Monday is a holiday. Uh, and so every quarter, this always ha every year this always happens where that Monday kind of throws off the schedule for the weekly homeworks and labs and such. In a regular week, I would love to have a, the order be a lab due Sunday night and then homework due Thursday afterwards. In my office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays to help support that learning. Um, because of the holiday, we're going to shift a little bit. So homework, homeworks uh, one and two will be a little bit different days of the week, but eventually we're going to get into a pattern of labs due on Sunday nights homeworks due on Thursday nights, uh, et cetera. Uh, for those assignments, we'll be turning them in on Gradescope, uh, which we set up autograders for. Uh, in particular, for the first set of assignments, so Lab 1 uh, should have actually gone live recently. Uh, I can go push that in a second. Um, that'll be due this coming Tuesday to accommodate the holiday in the long weekend, so you have a few days for that, but don't wait too long. Um, and then we'll make homework 1 due Friday rather than Thursday this coming week. But the future lab homeworks will be a little bit earlier. The future labs will be a little bit earlier. We're going to kind of, you know, slowly bridge that down. Hopefully it's okay because lab one and homework one aren't as long as later assignments. And as I told you earlier, right, please, please, please do your own early homeworks on time. You're going to want to save the days for later homeworks. Um, cool. Other logistic questions? Great. Okay. Thank you, folks. Have a good one.